in the previous modules we had been looking at the principal component analysis. The module before this we had looked at some of the very important results related to principal components. Primarily how to find them and what are their relationships with the original variables. In today's module we will be looking at some of the other features like for instance what happens when we standardize the variables and then do a principal component, what the geometry of the principal component really means and what about special structures of the dispersion matrix. What would be the type of principal components we get for this sort of special structures. We will also have a brief look at how to select the optimal number of principal components for our further studies. Now, it is easy to show that this row would have eigenvalues one of which or the largest of which would be lambda 1 equal to 1 plus m minus 1 into rho. Of course, rho has to be positive for this to be largest and all the remaining m minus 1 eigenvalues starting from lambda 2 to lambda m would be equal to 1 minus rho. So, you have a multiplicity in this case of m minus 1 eigenvalues equal to 1 minus rho and a single one which is lambda 1 and which is larger than the others. Now, if you calculate the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 1, you would find that p 1 turns out to be 1 by root over p m, 1 by root over m etcetera, 1 by root over m. So, the first principal component would come out to be y 1 which is equal to p 1 prime z is 1 by root over m summation i equal to 1 to m z i. And in this case you can see that the first principal component is primarily the sum of the variables original standardized variables divided by square root of m. Uh, would it be the same as doing the principal component? on the original variables? The answer is that they would be similar, but not exactly the same because the eigenvalues and eigenvectors in this case would come out to be slightly different. This is primarily because once we work with the original variables, the original variables have certain ordering in the sense of they have different weightage. A variable may be large, another variable may be small, etcetera. But once you standardize them, these advantages or disadvantages are neutralized and they have a different type of impact overall. So, that is why the results would be somewhat different in this case. Without going into the details, because the results would be similar to what we did for the original axis, let us very quickly look through the changes. Matrix notation, we can write the new variables z, these are the standardized variable as sigma half inverse x minus mu. Remember that sigma is positive definite. So, we can always have sigma half into sigma half equal to sigma. So, you take sigma half inverse x minus mu and that gives us the new variable z. And it is easy to see that the expectation of this z would be equal to 0. The dispersion of z would be sigma half inverse sigma sigma half inverse. And in matrix notation, you can write z as equal to v half to the power of minus 1 x minus mu, where v is a diagonal matrix with variances on the diagonal. So, if you use this, it is easy to see that expectation of z is equal to 0. Dispersion matrix of z is v half to the power of minus 1 sigma v half to the power of minus 1 and this you can readily see is the correlation matrix. So, now we are using the correlation matrix instead of the dispersion matrix to derive the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and that is the reason why there would be a difference. Now, using the same principles and I will just be stating this result uh, because the proof would be exactly similar. The ith principal component for the standardized variables would be given by y i which is p i prime z or p i prime v half to the power of minus 1 x minus mu. And uh, the summation of 
the variabilities of this y i's again would be the equal to the summation of the variabilities of the z i's and in this case remember that rho is a correlation matrix therefore its diagonals are all one so summation of the variance would be the sum of these diagonals which is equal to p or in this case it's equal to m so we have the sum of the variance equal to m and also the correlation between the ith variable the standardized variable and the jth principal component would be given by p j i square root of lambda j that's exactly what we got before except that we are dividing this by the sigma i i's but in this case it's standardized okay and in this case of course the lambdas and the p j's are basically the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs kth principal component would now be lambda k by p simply because the denominator is now p. So, the methods is the same, but mind you as I said that doing getting the eigenvalues of rho is different from getting it from sigma. So, there would be some changes in the result. To do that, it is easier if we look through the usual multivariate normal distribution. So, suppose x follows the multivariate normal distribution m dimensional with mean mu and variance sigma. Now, it is known from the multivariate normal results that the density of x is constant on the ellipsoid x minus mu prime sigma inverse x minus mu equal to c square. So, given a particular c square, the density would be constant over this. Okay? This is the ellipse which has an axis plus minus c root over lambda i e i where i runs from 1 to m. So, these are the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs again. So, a point lying on the i th axis of the ellipsoid will have coordinates which would be proportional to the p i's in the coordinate system that has origin mu and axis parallel to the original axis x 1, x 2, x p. Now, suppose we assume mu to be equal to 0 for a simplicity only. Okay? In that case, we can break up this c square equal to x prime sigma inverse x as 1 by lambda 1 p 1 prime x square plus 1 by lambda 2 p 2 prime x square etcetera up to 1 by lambda m p m prime x whole thing square. This is easy to do because sigma inverse mind you can be broken up in a spectral decomposition as summation of 1 by lambda j p j p j prime and then you pre and post multiply this by x and you get this result. So, what we have now here is that c square is equal to 1 by lambda 1 the first principal component squared plus 1 by lambda 2 the second principal component squared etcetera and this equation defines an ellipsoid in a coordinate system with x's as the axis and the directions p1, p2, pm respectively. Now, lambda 1 being the largest of the eigenvalues, the major axis would lie in the direction of p1 and similarly for the second one which is lambda 2 would be in the direction of p2. So, what it does basically is it makes a transformation remember that we are doing a principal component it means really that we are making an orthogonal transformation. So, the transformation is done in such a way that first principal component would lie along the more dense part of it. So, it will it will change direction according to the lay of the distribution form. If you have a distribution with variables which are highly positively correlated in that case it will use the correlation and determine the direction that way. So, it gives us a very good idea how to what the principal component really means and how we can get the major axis of the principal component. Next, let us look at some special covariance structures. The simplest covariance structure that we can think of is dispersion matrix is diagonal that is it is sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 sigma p uh, m m on the diagonal and 0 elsewhere. If we have such a sigma then what would be our principal components? Now, notice that vector e i which is the unit vector e i basically is a 
vector with zeros everywhere except in the ith position which has a 1. So, if we use this then we have the relationship that sigma e i is equal to small sigma i i e i because this from the matrix sigma e i would be pick up the i i element which is sigma i i and we can write it as e i which is 0 0 1 0 0 into the scalar sigma i i. Now, if we can write it this way it at once tells us that sigma i i is a eigenvalue of sigma and the e i's are the eigenvectors corresponding eigenvectors. So, in this case the eigenvector i th eigenvector eigenvalue pair is sigma i i e i. Now, what would be your y i? y i would be e i prime x which would simply pick out x i. So, y i is equal to x i which means that the i th principal component is the i th variable itself. So, what does this tell us? This tells us that nothing is gained by extracting principal components in this case because the principal components will be the original variables themselves. So, mind you in this case the variables are uncorrelated among themselves. So, if there is no correlation among the variables there is no common factor among them and hence the variables themselves would turn out to be their principal components. So, we do not really do a principal component analysis when the variables are uncorrelated to each other. Let us look at another structure. Let this is a very standard structure. Let sigma be equal to sigma square rho sigma square etcetera up to rho sigma square etcetera. So, if we take out sigma square from this sigma then we are left with the correlation matrix. I will work with this correlation matrix. Remember when you do you have such a situation? We have a situation like this when the correlation between the different variables are the same and the variances are constant which is equal to sigma square. So, if you have constant variances and same correlation every pair of variables then we can have a matrix of this type. Now, it is easy to show that this row would have eigenvalues one of which or the largest of which would be lambda 1 equal to 1 plus m minus 1 into rho. Of course, rho has to be positive for this to be largest and all the remaining m minus 1 eigenvalues starting from lambda 2 to lambda m would be equal to 1 minus rho. So, you have a multiplicity in this case of m minus 1 eigenvalues equal to 1 minus rho and a single one which is lambda 1 and which is larger than the others. Now, if you calculate the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 1 you would find that p 1 turns out to be 1 by root over p m 1 by root over m etcetera 1 by root over m. So, the first principal component would come out to be y 1 which is equal to p 1 prime z is 1 by root over m summation i equal to 1 to m z i and in this case you can see that the first principal component is primarily the sum of the variables original standardized variables divided by square root of m. The remaining eigenvectors can be obtained orthogonal to this mind you the remaining would have m minus 1 linearly independent vectors and you can always orthogonalize this. There are several choices for the remaining eigenvectors and one of the very standard ones is taking p 2 to be 1 by root over 1 into 2 minus 1 by root over 1 into 2 and the remaining 0 p 3 equal to 1 by root over 2 into 3 1 by root over 2 into 3 minus 2 by root over 2 into 3 and the remaining 0 and so on and so forth. So, each of these are now orthogonal to each other, but there are several other choices of this as well. More importantly, let us look at how much of the proportion of the total variability that the first principal component accounts for. Now, remember that this would be given by lambda 1 by m and we have 1 plus m minus 1 into rho by m and that is equal to rho plus 1 minus rho by m. So, that is the total population variation explained by the first principal component and you can see that this is going to be 
equal to almost equal to rho if either rho is very close to 1 which means the second term is almost 0 or if m is very large. So, if you have very high correlation among the different variables then the first principal component would account for a very large proportion of the variability and you need not be looking at the other principal components. So, the next question would be how many principal components do you think you should be taking into your model. We had been doing this arbitrarily till now we had been looking at this lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda g divided by the total variance and deciding on this, but how to be a little bit more objective how do you choose this. Now, what we can do is we can have what is referred to as a scree plot. Now, what is a scree plot? A scree plot plots the eigenvalues against the corresponding i. So, you plot lambda i hat against i. Remember lambda 1 hat is the largest. So, you have the first point having the largest value and then this would be decreasing. Okay? So, you can have a join them by lines and you can see that this would be a decreasing function. And uh, once it is it's not going to decrease in a straight line, it will be sort of exponentially decreasing. And once you find that there is a turning point which we generally refer to as an elbow. So, you have your arm stretched out and you break it at the elbow. So, th there would be a sort of hinge at the elbow. So, if you have this hinge at this curve it really means that before this point the eigenvalues are dropping very rapidly and beyond this point it has straightened out or flattened out sort of and hence it was not falling very rapidly. So, you do not gain by going from the one eigenvalue to a uh, next one if you are beyond this elbow. So, what is generally done is that you decide on where the elbow is you can visually see this from the scree plot and you take the number of eigenvalues equal to the whatever the i value is at the elbow point. This way you would be discarding very little of the remaining informations contained by the remaining eigenvalues which would be turning out to be very small. So, additional eigenvalues now if you bring them in would not account for much variability and even if you have a, not a very high percentage of variability by the previous ones you need to bring in a lot more of the eigenvalues or the variables principal components in this case and to explain the variability which would not be rational because we are trying to do the principal component so as to minimize the number of variables that we are looking at. So, a scree plot gives us a very good idea of how many principal components we should retain in our further studies. In today's lecture we started by looking at how we can obtain principal components from standardized variables. We saw that this does not give us exactly the same results as the original variables because the standardized variables would neutralize the individual effects of the different variables. So, in this case the eigenvalues and eigenvectors would be somewhat different, but in most cases the results are similar. We also saw how the principal components lie geometrically in the sense that they would be in the direction of the concentration ellipsoid the maximum uh, values that this concentration ellipsoid takes in a certain direction. And we also saw the special structures of the variances which lead to very special type of principal components. Important thing about to remember is this that if the variables variables are uncorrelated then you need not do a principal component because it does not lead you to any 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 result at all in fact you get back the same variables. So, remember you only do a principal component if the variables are correlated among themselves.